The Sellernomics Podcast, where we share valuable tips and information in the Amazon and e-commerce space. Each week, we deliver the best interviews with some of the top Amazon personalities in the industry to help you grow your business. Today's episode is brought to you by Gatita, the global leader in FBA auditing and reimbursements. Get $400 in free FBA reimbursements at gatita.com slash sellernomics. And now, here is your host, Lisa Kinski. Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's episode of Sellernomics. My name is Lisa Kinski, and I have with me a new friend, but very excited to get to know him. We just recorded a Prime Talk episode the other day. Very excited for our conversation today. I've got Henrik Johansson with me from Gemba, and we are going to be talking about how top e-commerce brands create new and unique products with ease. So let's bring him in. Henrik, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? <laughs> doing wonderful, dear. Thank you so much for being here. So oh, my we <laughs> we are going to talk about Gemba a little bit later in the episode for anybody who's unfamiliar, learn about who can work with you, what exactly it is you guys do. But right now, let's talk about new product development. So I think everybody's pretty familiar with like white labeling or reselling. So it begs the question, why develop new products? Great question. Uh, and that's why we exist. Uh, so, you know, I, I think you can divide the question into a few different sub questions that, you know, a lot of people, like you said, do private label, white label, which in, in our terms is, is really just selling sort of other people's products. They're not uniquely yours. And by the nif- definition, then you have a lot of other people selling that same product or very similar pro- product. And we all know what happens when there's a lot of people selling the same thing. It often becomes a race to the bottom in price. You know, if you mm-hmm. can get the same product in a lot of different places, odds are the customer's going to buy it wherever it's cheaper. Uh, so I think one of the key reasons why you develop new products is to have a product that's uniquely your own that other people are not selling. And really, if you're looking at any successful brand out there that it's, you know, a household name, they certainly have their own products, right? So certainly you can, you can achieve some level of success. And, and there's clearly a lot of people that had, have achieved a lot of success in marketplaces by selling other people's products. But if you're truly trying to create something of sustainable value, something that's going to be worth a lot, that somebody's going to want to acquire sometime in the future, I believe that the best way to get there is to have your own unique products that only you are selling that that gives your customers a reason to keep on coming back to you to buy that product. So I think that's, that's number one sort of differentiated from having your own product versus selling other people's products. Then, then there's a number of other reasons too, right? If you, if you think of your customer, you're selling a customer, you may have one hero product, right? That this is my top product, my, you know, my Yeti cup or my, you know, headphones or whatever it is. But, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the, the, the term, I, I know you are, but lifetime value of a customer, right? If, if you acquired a customer once, you sell them one product, great. If you only have one product to sell them, you're going to have to keep on acquiring new customers to sell them that same, that same product, right? But if you have a number of different products, you can acquire once and sell them many times. So that's what a lot of our customers do. You know, you may start your business with one hero product that you sell, but then how you can really monetize that customer many times is by having a lot of additional products you can sell them. You know what Amazon always says, you, if you like to buy this, you may also like to buy this. Right. So I think that's <laughs> that's reason one and two. And I think that <laughs> I think the third reason is is really that, and we've seen this more and more over the last few years, copycats are super fast. You know, so even if you find some niche, you find a product, you feel that you're the only seller or one of few sellers the you know the data is so easily accessible for many people and we talked to a lot of the bigger brands and they say you know if you if you have sort of just a, an also ran product some something that's just a small tweak on about 18 months maybe 24 months to really monetize that before that's going to be a really crowded field so we see a lot of sellers are shifting towards that a new mindset of you almost constantly have to launch new products in order to stay ahead of the copycat competition. 
if you rest on your laurels for too long, you might think, oh, this is going great. I'm selling this product right now. Super good margins. It's going to last forever. Odds are it's not going to last forever. That competition is going to, just going to start shipping away at you. So we believe that the best way to continue to stay ahead of the competition and continue to have healthy margins and high LTV is to continuously launch new cool products. Sorry, yeah. that was a long answer. No, that's okay. It was definitely a thorough answer. And and I think we can take this in a couple of different directions, right? Which are, how do you know if a, a new product idea is any good? And, and I think that's one of the reasons people private label or white label something is if it's a product that's already selling, yes, it's a race to the bottom with price, but you know it's already selling. You know you can make money with it versus if you make too unique yeah. of a product or anything that is too hyper niche, then you may have difficulty finding your audience or people are going to look at it and say, what is this? Like, and then you have difficulty being successful. So how do you know if a new product idea is even any good? Yeah. Great question. Okay. We'll do some editing. Okay. So let's just, um, just answer as though I just asked the question, which was, how do you know if a product idea is any good? That's a great question. And you're absolutely right. Uh, when you, the, the benefit of, of picking an existing product, right? Picking something that's already selling is that, you know, there are sales, there are buyers out there looking for it. Um, so I think it's, it's super important when if you create a new product to to still leverage that research the data all right we uh, most folks use helium 10 jungle scout zone guru other tools like that data dive and those are excellent at finding existing products but they're also excellent at identifying what keywords that people are searching for mm -hmm. and you can leverage that into finding new products so it's another level of, of analysis that that uh some researchers do out there and we help our customers with is really looking at what do people like and don't like about existing products so you can see what the you know what a five-star reviews have in common what a one-star reviews have in common so you can start identifying basically what what features that people are looking for or, or are not looking for in new products and help that guide you in developing that that new product those new product features basically so you're not just shooting in the dark you're just not coming up with a new fidget spinner and hoping that people's gonna like it because you're <laughs> absolutely right oh it certainly won't uh, and then you know there's additional tools like you know pick foo and other tools like that to go out and validate it so once you come up with this new product design you don't just launch it, but go out and test different versions of it, see what people like and don't like about it. Uh, so you can either sort of do it yourself, research using those available tools, so you can engage somebody like Gamba to help you with that research and figuring out what products are people actually looking for to maximize your odds of success. Yeah, I've, I've always felt that reviews are so much more than just getting your ranking higher on Amazon. It's really about learning what your customer needs, even within your own product. If you yeah. are getting a lot of positive reviews saying that they appreciate the durability of your item and that's not in your listing, add that in there. Like that's yeah, going to be a, a huge selling point for it. So yeah. what would you say is, I guess what's, what's, difficult about developing new products or maybe what's a, a a complexity with developing a new product that doesn't exist when just private labeling something that's already in existence yeah yeah great question i think that's a, that's a perfect contrast to draw and, and compare it to right because like you said if you start with something or exist you know you, some of the research is already done so i think that's step number one if you're developing something you, you absolutely have to do the research you have to use all the information that's available to you to test is there actually a market for that but then you you still have sort of the the we always to look at the four phases of product development which is research design sourcing and then manufacturing and the risk is of course higher in each one of those steps when you're developing something new versus if you're just going with something existing you're going with something existing you're placing a purchase order you have to find the factory somewhere and place the po and you know, there's some risk to it that, you know, it could still, things could go wrong, but it's a relatively safe, uh, well-known practice versus if you go into designing something new. Well, now let's say you've gone through the research, you identified that you, let's say you're looking for a, a Yeti cup with a temperature gauge on it. So you can see if uh, the fluid is hot or cold, you don't want to burn your lips. Maybe that's what you learned from the reviews. Like, like oh, I burn my lips on my coffee all the time. It's like, okay, 
let's let's put a little red light there that indicates if the coffee's too hot. Okay, so you got the idea. Now you got to go into design. So you have to figure out how do I turn that into a product, right? Because now it's, there's some electrical components there, probably, right? Since it's a light, and you know, and then you got to incorporate that into the bottle. So you need a product design, basically, and. In a product like that, you probably need an industrial designer and you need an electrical engineer. Uh, so you need a very specific expertise and ideally somebody who works on a product like that. So you know, in each of the steps from design to sourcing to manufacturing, I think that there's a level of expertise that's required that you want to tap into when you create new products. Uh, because something, if something goes wrong in just one of those steps, the risk is that the whole product journey will go wrong. Yeah. I'm happy to jump into more details on, on those steps too, but I don't want to go too deep right away. I think, well, we have so much more to cover, but I I, I love yeah. the idea you just gave of the, the temperature light on the Yeti cup. I feel like I have ideas like that all the time where I just want to mm -hmm. be paid to be someone's ideal woman. Because yeah. once you're talking <laughs> about finding an engineer and, and this person, I'm like, oh no, I just had the, I just want to see it. Like, yeah. I just want to wish it into existence, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's why it's so hard, right? Because there, there is no place, uh, and again, don't, don't want this to be a pitch for Gemba, but if you ask people, where do I go to find existing products? Like 99% will probably say, yeah, you go to Alibaba. Yeah, you go there. That's where you sure. find stuff. If you ask people, where do you go to create new products? I don't know what people say. I think you get 99 different answers yeah, sure. if you ask 100 people, right? So that's what, what why we created Gemba, because we know it doesn't exist. And we know it's it's daunting. Or just like you said, oh, i got to go hire an industrial designer, an electrical engineer that knows something about how to create a bottle with a line on it. And, you know, even if you do find them, now what do they do? Or do you have the expertise to, you know, tell them what to do, who, who does what and what order and what are the deliverables and, and what are they? What are the outcomes that have to come out of that? But so you can get a spec that you can actually give to the factory that they can quote on. So there's a lot of knowledge that go into that. And, and that's why we always recommend that to, at least if you're doing it the first time, and maybe if you're doing it for the, for the fifth time too, to work with experts that can help guide you through that process so that you don't make those mistakes that can be very costly in the end. Yeah, absolutely. I think definitely hiring an expert like Gemba is, you know, again, not to make it a pitch for Gemba, we'll do that at the end. But, <laughs> you know, hiring an expert to help you because when you're working with these factories and, and these manufacturers, you really have to break it down. I remember as a kid, we did this exercise of like, write down the steps to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And yeah. we don't yeah. think of it as like, it's like, okay, you take two pieces of bread, you get peanut butter and jelly sandwich it and enjoy yeah. it. It's like, yeah. get the bread out of the cupboard, take off the twist tie, take, I mean, you have to get really, really yeah. granular. And most people just don't think in that way. But you had said something before about, you know, seeing there, if, if, where do you go to like get existing products? Right. And I wonder like, where do folks go to see if there's an existing patent that they're infringing on? Because it's easy enough to say, you know, like Yeti has a patent on their bottle or whatever, that's easy enough to find. But if somebody has a utility patent, cause there's two kinds, right? Utility patent and design patent. As far as I know, mm -hmm. we could, you know, get a patent yeah. lawyer in here for more detail. Yeah. But if you're trying to file a patent on something or create a product how do you know if you're infringing on somebody else's thus getting yourself into even more trouble than before yeah it's a great question we get it every day so for starters we're not uh we're not attorneys so we can't provide legal counsel that said we have one partners that that do that so we have excellent ip attorneys that can help with that and two we do very thorough research that is not technically patent research but as you know, Amazon really only recognizes and help enforce design patents. They don't get involved in utility patents. And most design patents, you can you can get a fair reading of if if you're creating something that's almost exactly identical to to what someone else has created, right? By just through the the design process. So again, we always recommend that someone who has concerns about that retain a legal counsel, an expert in IP law. And, and do a patent search. Uh, but also, you know, at the early stage, you, you kind of have to have a complete finished design before you can really dig in deep into that and try to get your own patent. You can certainly research what else is out there and try to make sure you don't do exactly the same thing, which you don't want to do anyway. What's the point of creating a product if you create right. exactly the same? <laughs> but, uh, but then 
as you're finalizing the drawings and you get close to this and you're ready to place a big PO, then it, I, th I think it's always worth to do uh, some level of uh, IP research to make sure you're not violating anybody else's patent. Gotcha. Good, good note. And I love the disclaimer. We are not lawyers, people. We are not attorneys. <laughs> <laughs> this is not legal advice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Henrik, we are going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor. But when we come back, definitely want to continue this conversation and talk about tooling and cost. So we will be hey. right back in just a second. Hi, Amazon sellers. Make sure to maximize your Amazon FBA profits with Gatira. We're dedicated to maximizing your FBA reimbursements. Plus, for Selenomics listeners, we've prepared a $400 offer to get started. So just visit getita.com forward slash Selenomics to claim your offer and start boosting your Amazon profits today. And remember, with Getita, your hard-earned money and profits stays in your pocket. All right, y'all, be sure to head over to getita.com forward slash Sellernomics for the first 400 in FBA reimbursements free. We are back with Henrik Yo Johansson from Gemba. Um, hey. so, so let's talk about, about tooling, right? So the whole purpose of creating a new product is to make something new and unique. And in theory, you would have a little bit of difficulty finding a manufacturer who, who can just say, oh, I can make that for you, no problem. Like we're a spatula manufacturing plant where a bottle manu like if you're making a totally new product it's it's going to cost a fair bit so how do you find the manufacturer that's going to be best suited to tackle your project and what are the upfront costs to kind of get like a two-part question in there yeah great great question and the answer is it depends a lot on the type of product but let me give you a more actionable answer uh one problem we see a lot is folks coming to us and they've done product design in isolation from manufacturing. You know, there's a term in design called DFM, design for manufacturing, that I'm sure you're aware of. But, and that basically what it means is that through the design phase, you make sure that you're designing it for manufacturability. And the way to ensure that is to involve relevant factories during the design process to get their feedback on the product you're making. Right. So, of course, if you're making something completely new and innovative that's never made before, also you're going to have to spend a fair amount on tooling and moldings. And like you said, uh, I'd say 80 percent of our customers are really looking to create some incremental improvement, some something that is a unique skew that's different from anything else in the market. But uh, they don't really have a you know a vision or a very detailed vision of exactly what that needs to look like. So go back to the the bottle with the with the temperature gauge on it. Like, does it really have to be this rounded corner or does it have to be this handle or, or are they somewhat flexible as long as that core feature of the temperature gauge is 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 on there? And normally if if there's some flexibility, we can we find that we can save uh, brand sellers more than 50% of the costs of a traditional product development project by working directly with the factories early in the process because if you start with what's feasible and what's what's you know affordable what can be made without massive retooling you can often find a result that's satisfactory to, to the customer that they can get done faster better cheaper uh, with lower costs quicker than they would versus if they design something from pretty completely you know from scratch at a very high level of of detail and then go into the factory and say, can you make this exactly this way? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, definitely. And and I wonder what what is the timeline for doing something like this? Coming up with, you know, from today, I have an idea for a new product to yeah. having it in hand, completed, ready to go on the shelf. Yeah. So I'd say for for a medium complexity product let's say like a insulated drinking cup with some feature to it right you're probably looking for the traditional method at least three months of design probably another three months of sourcing and then you know three months of manufacturing so like nine to twelve okay. months if everything goes goes well right versus if you take the what we call the the direct manufacturing path uh you could probably get through with one month of design one to two months of, of sourcing and then a month to two months of manufacturing. So you could shrink that nine to 12 months into three to four months if you're flexible on, on what it looks like and as long as it meets your core features. So 
you could potentially have a significant reduction in in cost and time to market and the faster you can get that product to market right the faster you can start making money on it sure and get a return on your investment so it's generally unless our uh, the prospect or the customer is looking for something very unique or they have a very clear picture of how this is going to innovate and change something and it has a huge revenue potential we almost always recommend that do the design for manufacturing see what's feasible see what's what the what the factories can can create help create that meets your needs and use that as a path to get to market faster and, and with lower risk than traditional method okay and then what about like sampling this isn't a, a question that we had from, yeah. from the jump, but generally speaking, uh, we're talking about manufacturing overseas, right? So it's not like I can yeah. run down to my, you know, drive an hour, get to my manufacturer, tinker with the first iteration and then say, well, I want to change this, this and this. Yeah. So yeah. what about sampling? How soon should they order a sample? How many samples does it usually take to get it right? How long does it take to get your sample? Should you have boots on the ground to vet the sample for you? Like what's your recommendation there? Yeah, I mean, one, always got to do sampling right particularly you know it, it may be i mean i'd say even if you're just private labeling and, and you want to see a sample before you put your label on it and sell it to your customers right but particularly if you're making any kind of modifications because the slightest modification may alter the functionality of that product so you absolutely have to see samples and we generally recommend that you see samples from multiple different provider because it's not always like the most reputable or the most expensive is the best. Sometimes you may get an awesome sample from somebody who's a lesser known that's willing to be more aggressive, right? So yes, get samples, ideally get it from multiple different folks. And, and uh, definitely if you're making modifications, uh, make sure you get samples and, and plan for multiple sample iterations because typically the first iteration is not going to be perfect. Uh, I, don't know if I've ever seen that happen. It's very <laughs> rare, right? Because also the factory, you have to understand their motivations. They're they're not going to you know polish this or or make it, make it perfect. It's not going through the traditional product line mostly, production line as they make it. So the key with the first sample is typically just to prove that the functionality that you're looking for is actually working. Once that's been validated, then they can fine tune it and refine it with your feedback. But uh, we see that quite a lot that people get really disappointed with the first sample They're, you know, this is the first time they receive a package and they're like, Oh, this is going to be my perfect golden sample, my perfect product. And first samples are very seldom that, right. It's more of a proof of concept, a prototype, if you will, uh, to see that, okay, this product concept is going to work. Now let's refine it and fine tune it and make it perfect and polished and beautiful. Yeah. That's part of it's, the fun part of the process though, right? Is like seeing your first iteration of it. And I think it's, so. It's, it's like a first podcast episode. You're so excited to start it. And then like now going back to listening to my first ever episode, I'm like, oh my gosh, what a dumpster fire. <laughs> but like, yeah. you know, but it was fun and exciting at the time. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's just like to help with the journey. Developing a website or software or something like yes. that. You would never start with a full resolution finished product. You start with wireframes. You start with the simplest version of it to visualize what you're trying to achieve and then you iterate and iterate right your, your mvp your minimum viable product is is all we're yeah. after here does it work okay cool now make it pretty yeah. um so what would be your recommendation then for sellers creating their first product what would you recommend as the first step to get started developing a new and unique product yeah i, th I think research unless you have a clear i mean sometimes we get folks that you know are, are in close contact with the customers and they come in as like i just know that my customers want this product uh, i still recommend some level of research too because even if they're saying that they want it do you know exactly what they're looking for um do you know what the competition is for that product that's something we see sometimes that people come in and say yeah i want to make one of these and then you create that thing with the, the drinking cup and they realize that yeti has a version of that and now suddenly you're you know competing with somebody that has hundred million dollar advertising budget, right? So uh, I think even if you are convinced that your idea is a great one, we always recommend research on the front end. Um, sorry, what was the question again? <laughs> what do you recommend as the first step? Yeah, what do I recommend? Research? First step, research, hundred <laughs> percent research. Yeah. And what do you think are the most common mistakes that sellers make when developing new products? Other other than not doing not research. Not doing research. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think it's it's uh, trying to wing it and 
and not being willing to invest in it, right? Because like we talked about, there's design and uh, industrial design and, and potential engineering that's required. And then, you know, really take the time to try to find, make sure you find the right factory partner. Take the time to get samples. And if they're not perfect, iterate and get samples again. And, and don't just rush to get the product to market. And finally, doing the manufacturing, you absolutely have to do QC in factory as the, the first products roll off the production line. You have to have a team there. You know, you're probably not going to have your own employees, but hire a QC team that goes into the factory, that oversees it, that represent you. Uh, even if you have a great factory partner and trust them, I think it's always worth trust but verify, right? Get someone in there that will take pictures, mm -hmm. test everything, and make sure they test everything that you're looking for. Um, and you know, if you hire an expert QC firm, that that they usually know what to, what to look for, and and really make sure that once you get a container full of products in the U.S., that you're not getting something that you're going to be disappointed on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, test it to the nth degree. Any possible use case for something, yeah. test it. See how yeah. it performs. Because, like you alluded to, if you're not explicit, they they're probably not going to test it. Right? We had one product that showed up. The product was perfect, but the logo was on you know, at an angle, oh. <laughs> you figured that would be obvious based on the samples and everything gone through, but there was not a specific QC step to measure that the, that the logo was put on there at the perfect angle. So that's just still an example of that. Everything yeah. you have to have everything in the QC spec. There was a, um, I, I used to work for a company called Noviland. We did end to end supply chain and, and helped a lot with sourcing. And there was a client that we had had who was sourcing a, a spatula and their logo, I, I guess, was oil based. And so using it in the kitchen with cooking oil, it was just coming straight off onto oh, no. consumers hands. And it's like, oh, my gosh, we didn't think of it. It's like so like use it where it's going to be used, like and how it's going to be used. Um, yeah. Henrik, this has been just spectacular. Thank you so much. Will you please share with us more about Gemba, who you help, how you help, and where folks can get in touch with you? Yes, of course. So at a very high level, Gemba helps sellers and brands develop new products. Uh, and we do that through two things. One, we have a proprietary software platforms that know how to develop pretty much any product. So you don't have to bring the knowledge of all the steps that we talked about before. We just plug in what product you're trying to create and you will identify all the steps and deliverables in that process. And in addition to that, we have a large network of experts who are designers and engineers. And then we have factories all over the world that we also plug into that. So uh, almost anyone can develop products as if they were pro and they leverage the Gemba platform and network. And then of course we have assigned account managers that will follow through the process and make sure that everything goes well. And if you don't, if the factory isn't performing, then we'll work with you to try to find a new factory, et cetera. So we're not gonna, just going to leave uh, our customers to their own, but uh, really help them guide through that process. And as we talked about, we know a lot of tips and tricks. We see ourselves as a guide to try to help the seller to find the very best path for their budget and the product they're trying to develop. So that if you, you know, if you have a big budget and you have a very unique vision of a new product that's going to revolutionize the world, well, then, you know, you probably want to spend that nine to 12 months and, you know, maybe $100,000 to develop that unique product and, and probably get the patents and all that stuff. But if you're just looking to, looking to add another SKU to your yoga brand or your pet brand or your baby brand, probably doesn't require that level of investment. And you should be able to find a new SKU, make it, make it your own, make it unique and get that to market, you know, in three, four months instead at a fraction of that cost. I'm curious, have you pursued creating a new product yourself or? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we try to stay out of that. We want to be the, the provider, the service provider. You know, many, many people on our team are you know, expert product developers. You know, our co-founder, Steve Bluestein, he, he was in Shark Tank and got his uh, uh, pet product brand funded. And, you know, our entire, most of our design team are from Dyson. So, you know, some of the best product designers in the world. Uh, so we have we have tons of that expertise in our team, but we we focus on helping our customers develop new products. We we don't develop our own. I love that. And you guys are, I think we talked about this at the end of Prime Talk, but um, really looking for folks who understand how to sell online. So maybe not a super great fit for somebody 
launching their first product ever, but somebody who understands brand building, understands selling online, and is just looking to move their brand forward would be a good fit to work with Gemba. Is that right? Yeah, I'd say most of our customers are definitely that. They've figured out how to sell and they have an existing brand and now they want to add more SKUs to it. But certainly if, if it's a, a company that have a, a big vision and they have the funding to develop the product, we'd be happy to help help with that. Um, but I'd say our, our target customers typically like a million in revenue and above. Perfect. Okay. And then where can folks reach out and learn more if they have any questions? Best ways to email me, Henrik at Gemba.com. That's H-E-N-R-I-K at G-E-M-B-A-H.com. Or go to Gemba.com and check it out. We have a lot of uh, good information. If you're trying to learn about product development in general, product design, uh, we have a lot of free research report and different product categories. So you can learn a lot about, find ideas about, you know, new products you might want to work on. I think you'll enjoy uh, uh, browsing the site and uh, getting ideas. And if you want help, we're, we're standing by. Amazing. And again, you guys, it's Gemba.com. If you want to learn more, you can email Henrik directly at Henrik at Gemba.com. You already spelled it out for the audio listeners. Makes my life easy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, Henrik, super appreciate your time. I, I love this conversation. It's a little nostalgic for me having come from this world before. So excited yeah, to have done. this conversation and um, really just continue to work with you and your team. And so thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Take care, Lisa. Yeah. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. And thank you so much for everybody who tuned in today. If you liked what you heard, please be sure to give us a thumbs up, share your thoughts with us in the comments, subscribe to the show, and we will see you all on the next one. Thanks for joining us this week on the Sellernomics podcast. Special thanks to our sponsor, Gatita. Did you know that Amazon probably owes you money for FBA reimbursements? Get $400 in free FBA reimbursements at gatita.com slash Sellernomics. Be sure to join us again next week for more great tips on how to grow your business. And thanks again for listening.